love, war, madness, piracy, murder and adultery. The Vernies tells the story of an English family in the 17th century. Based on the near miraculous survival of thousands of Verney family letters found in an attic, Adrian Tinniswood explores the history of this apparently ordinary family. It was 1608 and the future was looking promising for the Verney family. Over the past hundred years, a mixture of luck and good judgment had brought them prosperity and security and transformed a clan of country squires into influential courtiers and large-scale landowners. So when the head of the family suddenly sold up, walked out on his teenage wife and moved to Morocco, the Vernies were shaken. When he turned to piracy and converted to Islam, they were appalled. And when death ended his short career as a Barbary Coast buccaneer, and his turban and slippers were shipped back to the family manor house in a tiny Buckinghamshire village, they heaved a sigh of relief and settled back into a quiet life of farming and local politics. Their troubles had just begun. My book's about three generations of a Buckinghamshire gentry family in the 17th century. It's a kind of a 17th century foresight saga. The family is like any other family. They fall out, they fight, I mean, they are literally a family by the sword divided in that some of them are royalists and one or two are parliamentarians in the Civil War, um, which is a huge problem for them. The book starts with a pirate, Sir Francis Verney, in the reign of James I, and it ends with the death of Sir Rafe Verney in the reign of William of Orange. So it covers the entire 17th century, which is one of the most remarkable centuries in, in, in British history anyway. You've got sort of internecine feuds, you've got civil war, we kind of, we, we attempt to blow up one king in the gunpowder plot, we cut the, another king's head off, we throw another one out. And that's the backdrop against which the Verneys survived. Claydon House, the, the Verney's ancestral seat, um, goes back to the late Middle Ages. But in the 1820s, the house came to um, a Verney cousin, a man called Harry Calvert. And when he took possession of his inheritance, he opened the door to a, a, a gallery up at the top of the house. And the sight that met his eyes was a, a treasure trove of documents. There were letters and, and bills and, and manuscripts piled high on trestle tables, stacked up against, against doors and walls, over a hundred thousand. And, you know, he came on this unique collection, quite possibly the biggest collection of private correspondence from the 17th centuries. But the family papers um, cover much more than the 17th century. I mean, they start in the Middle Ages and they run right through into the 20th century. So um, it's just that the 17th century is particularly well represented. Historians have always um, sort of trawled through the Verney papers. So they've picked out bits and pieces. What I've tried to do is just take a, a, a narrative history, try to tell the story of these three generations and tried to get inside their souls, tried to see what it was like to be a Verney in the 17th century. The real hero of the, of the Verney correspondence, I suppose, I suppose is, is Sir Rafe Verney, the 17th century, I mean, who's in many ways the central character in my book. I still don't know why, but he meticulously hoarded and labelled and catalogued every piece of correspondence he, he, he received. And one of the great things about the, the, the collection is that Sir Rafe, kept his rough copies of, of his own correspondence. There's a, a wonderfully poignant letter from Rafe to his father, Sir Edmund Verney, when he thought his father was going to see action in, in Scotland in the First Bishop's War. And it's a heart-rending plea to his father. You may easily guess how this afflicts me, for if you go, I shall never think to see you more, but with grief confess that never man did more willfully cast away himself. Till now, I never had the least reason to suspect your affection. But when I see you thus hastily run to your own ruin, and as it were, purposely to lose that life that is so much dearer to me than my own, how can I think you love me? Sir Edmund Burney, who's the, 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 the head of the family from the early 17th century through to his death in 1642, he and his wife, Margaret, had 10 children four boys and six girls, as Rafe himself, the, the, the eldest, 
Then there's Tom, who's the most wonderful character to write about. He's a black sheep with no redeeming qualities whatsoever, an absolute villain. There's young Munn, who's a dashing um, cavalier. There's Henry, who's a professional, professional gambler. Um, and then there are the girls as well, who have equally interesting stories. Sir Edmund was Charles I standard bearer. Um, he felt he couldn't desert the king. He'd been, he'd been a courtier, a minor official. So he carried the king's standard into battle at Edge Hill in October 1642. And he was hacked to death on the field. They all, all they found was his hand still clutching the standard. And I often think what it must have been like for his son Rafe, who was sitting in Parliament when they brought the news of his father's death and everybody cheered. His own side had killed his dad. The mythologizing which envelops Sir Edmund's death over the following months makes it hard to piece together exactly what happened next. His body was never found. According to an old Verney legend, the soldiers were unable to prize the standard from his cold, dead hand. So they duly hacked off the hand and carried it away with them. There's a great monument to him which his son put up in lieu of a, a burial. After Sir Edmund's death, Rafe, who's still only, what, he's in his late 20s, is head of the family, and Rafe is a parliamentarian. But there are, there are different kinds of hero. Sir Edmund Verney was the hero of cavalier romance, careless of his personal safety, putting his honour before his life. His eldest son wasn't that kind of man. Fretful and querulous, uncomfortable in the hunting field and frightened at the thought of a battlefield, Sir Rafe always felt keenly just how different he was from his father and his three soldier brothers. But his stand over the Solemn League and Covenant was breathtaking. It earned him a place in history. Rafe was never a man of action, but he was really high, highly principled. And he was the only MP who didn't feel able to take the Solemn League and Covenant, the only MP on his own side anyway. And eventually he was forced to go into exile. He spent some 10 years in France. Um, his estate was sequestrated. He was, um, his, his fortune was ruined. His family deserted him, apart from his, his wife. It was left to Mary to save the family fortunes. Rafe couldn't come back to England or he would have faced arrest by his creditors. So it was Mary who came back and who lobbied Parliament and who finally managed to, to, to get the family estates back on an even keel. It's astonishing that on one single day, she heard about the death of the little boy that she had over here, and also she received news that her daughter Peg had died in France. And she raved and screamed and took to her bed, but for two days, that was all. Then she just got up and went back to the business of saving the family fortune. She was an incredibly strong woman. She's a wonderful woman. Rafe and Mary had two children that survived. Jack, as a second son, um, went into business and he actually went out to Syria. Profit and loss were everything to Jack. Munn was a willful clown. He was a big buffoon of a, of a boy, um, his father's despair. But much to everyone's surprise, he managed to marry a beautiful heiress next door. It seemed a marriage made in heaven. But Munn's perfect marriage, that had its own problems because Mary was withdrawn to be, after a few months of marriage, it was clear that she was, she was quite depressed. Um, she was very jealous. She was, con she was convinced that Mum was being unfaithful to her, uh, as indeed he was. Um, but this led to paranoid delusions, and in fact, to, to several psychotic episodes. In short, Mary went mad. I decided to end the book with Sir Rafe Fernie's death in 1696. I mean, he'd, he'd lived right through the 17th century. He'd seen all these changes. He'd, he'd, he'd been part of many of these changes. And he, his life seemed to sort of, to me, to sum up the 17th century, you know, with all its convoluted politics and its magic and its squalor and its beauty.